Say, I choose to believe. Say it again, I choose to believe. You probably will want to put that on a three by five card, tape it on the mirror and see it. I choose to believe. His word is his wisdom. His wisdom produces faith. Faith comes. How many knows faith goes? <laughs> How many is trying to work on the come part? <clears throat> what enters can exit. Faith is trust. Faith is confidence. Faith is a product of wisdom. How do we know that? Deuteronomy 4, verse 6 says, His word is His wisdom. His word is His wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to discern right from wrong. Right decision, wrong decision. Right road, wrong road. Right relationship, wrong relationship. Right business deal, wrong business deal. That's, the diff that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is the ability to solve a problem. Wisdom is the ability to make right choices. The choices that produce long-term benefit. Inside of you is a passion to obtain. You cannot escape it. You cannot overcome it. How many has noticed that none of your prayers has removed your humanity? Most spiritual folks I know can't get delivered from being a human. I doubt that angels are requesting the transfer and the transition, but we often wish, God, I'll double my tithe if you'll turn me into an angel. Inside of us is a passion to obtain. Didn't come through the fall. Didn't come through the sin nature. It is not the sin nature. How do we know that? When Lucifer, in the form of a serpent in the Garden of Eden, offered the forbidden fruit to Eve, she reached. Wouldn't you like to be like God? Wouldn't you like to know what God knows? Wouldn't you like to have what God has? Wouldn't you? She hadn't fallen. Sin had not entered the picture. No wrong decisions had been made. But he worked with her nature this passion to obtain. It's the God part of you. It's the divine part of you. To obtain. That's why I said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. You can't escape it. You can't pray it away. And even those who are upset with what you want to obtain are trying to obtain something else. So you cannot overcome nor escape this passion to obtain. The 800,000 words in the Bible were written to teach you how to obtain lawfully. How to obtain and enjoy what you obtained. Whether you want to obtain a job, 
a new car, a stress-free environment, a happy relationship, a peaceful marriage, a well-mannered child, a level of success in giftings, open doors for your singing, for your publish a book. No matter what you want to obtain, God understands it. And the Bible is a book of procedures. Explaining desire and how to obtain. He tells you some things that you cannot obtain. Those things are reserved. Paul put it this way, there are diversities of gifts. To one, this is possible to obtain. To another, this is possible to, to attain. To another, this is possible to obtain. God is very aware and try to remind yourself that he, he's brighter than you. <laughs> try, it's a lot of self-talk. Tell someone next to you, say, act smart, even if you're not. Just look at them, say, just act smart, even if you're not. Act smart. <laughs> like eggs taken in the wind that start turtles and fish and plants and weeds. Wrong desires can often grow in us. And you could even obtain things that God didn't want you to have. You're kidding. He would let me have something he doesn't want me to have. Yep. God didn't want Israel to have a king, but they didn't like the prophet method, so he let them have a king. May you never have something God doesn't want you to have. Remember Hezekiah? God said it's time for you to close down Bring your house still closed. I'm finished with you. The best in you is emptied. It's over. Bring it to a close. Finish your diary. Tell your family goodbye. Get your house in order. And Hezekiah, huh? Oh, no, no, no. I. Shoot, I, that's some Chinese food I hadn't eaten. And I, I, I need some Chinese food. That's Murdoch translation. He puts his face to the wall. God, I want to live longer. What's he saying to God? I don't, I don't agree with you. I, I, don't, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you at all. This is what I want. That's, you got it. And it was then that he brought into the world Manasseh. A wretch of a son who tore down everything Hezekiah had built for God. All the good that Hezekiah had done was destroyed by his son Manasseh, which means to forget. Manasseh is not a bad word. Joseph used it when he named his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim was the blessed one. 
Manasseh was the first one, which means to forget the things in my father's house. Ephraim means to be blessed, to be bountiful. You have to forget before you're produced and fruitful. Yesterday, you have to leave the past before you can enter the future. You've got to be willing. But God gave him what he wanted. So I find myself praying this prayer. Birth your desires in me. How many has ever got what you wanted and hated what you got? I used to preach a song, sermon when I was 17 years old. He got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. <laughs> That's a song. Isn't it? Paul McCartney, at the time he was worth $600 million, famous singer of the Beatles, said, I would give up my 600 million for the ability to walk down the street unrecognized. The burden of fame destroyed the joy of focus. The most famous people in the world have to use their money or security and cameras to protect what they have. May you never have something God didn't give you. May you never have anything God didn't choose to give you. May you never have anything God did not choose to give you. May you never have anything God did not choose to give you. Precious brother, so good to see you. Thank you for loving the wisdom of God. Heard about you, so thankful. Thankful, thankful for your passion for wisdom. I'm going to invest a little time today, and that's why we call it a 2 o'clock service. In fact, we're going to move from the 5 o'clock time to the 2 o'clock time. And I don't like waiting four hours for surf for five o'clock, so I'm, I, I can't wait all afternoon with nothing. And uh, so, uh, just so you know it, we break for lunch, come back at two, etc. The teaching this morning on negotiation will change your life forever. And I, I don't know what Cindy Price taught but it wasn't nearly as rich <laughs> as the teaching on negotiation. I'm just kidding. I hear so many good things. Her and Flo, I heard about Flo's teaching the other day, my sister, and all of this. And I heard that Pastor Eleazar, where is Pastor Eleazar? He was in the class earlier. I heard he was just wonderful. And uh, that was funny. Him from Mexico in my pulpit, and I'm in Mexico preaching for his folks, and we had it was uh, remarkable. I will not, uh, I will not say a whole lot, other than the hunger was beyond description, the thirst, the craving for the wisdom of God. So many, many, many preachers, and it was um, there's no way to say it except it was a God thing, a very much God thing, and we were thankful. The three topics today, 9 o'clock, was negotiation. Getting what you need by helping someone get what they want. The topic this morning is adaptation, the hidden mystery to perpetual favor. That's the title. Bruce, if you want to write it down there, Daniel. Adaptation, the hidden mystery to perpetual favor. Because I want to show you that favor should not be an experience. It should be a lifestyle. And the master key to perpetual favor is continuous adaptation. The subject at 2 o'clock will be presentation, presenting yourself, presenting your business, presenting an idea. The number one authority in the world on presentation costs $10,000 a day. And he teaches on presenting yourself, presenting a business, presenting an idea. 
everything is in the packaging. I'll talk about that at the two o'clock, how that when God wanted to present his son, he put angels in outer space hanging on clouds to sing. Glory to God. God's a master at presentation. I said, God's a master at presentation. I think when you enter heaven, you will be speechless at what God presents. Hallelujah. I said, God is a master at presentation, presenting entry. We'll talk about that at 2 o'clock because it has everything to do, everything to do with your success in life. Adaptation. is not the denial of your difference. Adapting to a schedule, adapting to another person, adapting to an environment is not denial of your distinctive difference from others. You that's joined us by streaming live, which one is this? This streaming live, you that's joined us there at your home, we're thankful for you. Thank God for you. And we're grateful that you have a passion for wisdom. Feel free to email us your prayer request to pray now. Pray now at the wisdom center dot TV. The most successful people in the world are those who have mastered the art of adaptation. The most successful businesses on earth are those who labor to adapt to a market, to a neighborhood, an environment. Emerging times. I did not have a website address several years ago, didn't know anything about the internet. Staff had computers. I knew nothing. Didn't matter to me. I had people say, you need to have a website. I didn't realize that it was a place where you could give others information without giving them your time. I didn't realize that a website address should be for every human on the earth should have a website address where you can place the pictures instead of mailing them to 10 different relatives, put them on your website. Messages, changes, information. Until I read in Forbes magazine, if I recall, that if you were presently succeeding without a website in five years, you would be out of a business. I believed the difference in people is who they've chosen to trust. And I believed. And I began to labor to adapt. I didn't know how to operate a computer, didn't care, didn't want to. Dinosaurs do not exist because of one thing, adaptation. Adaptation. It was the mystery, it was the hidden secret of Joseph, of Abraham and Isaac, Rebecca. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes. And my goal today is to get you to consider adaptation as a new tool in your success collection. that you will consider this adapting, whether it's to an environment, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's with your children, whether it's in your business, to get you to consider the ingredient of adapting 
the purpose of adaptation is to create a reward. If there's no benefit, adaptation is unnecessary, unneeded, probably a mistake. We adapt to avoid pain. North Korea is a bigger problem than anybody wants to discuss. They have nothing to lose because they're not afraid of killing millions to secure something. Wars are never between nations, they're between men. Men in position of decision making. We don't even know anybody in North Korea. So we're implementing by our ambassador to the United Nations, who I think, John Bolton, I think is very effective in his perception and discerning of the nature of nations. The mystery of Iraq right now is that President Bush and others did not realize that it runs by a philosophy. The people adapted to dictatorship because it removed decision making. We're seeing this happen in the news. We're changing our tactics with North Korea. Why? We really are not able to fight many wars in many other places. We don't have the resources, the energy. I don't think we have the courage to take on too many enemies simultaneously. All of us at home, of course, with Kentucky Fried Chicken saying, go get them. Not us, but go get them. But we're adapting a different strategy with North Korea than we had with Saddam Hussein, though 10 years of dialogue failed to produce a result. Other men have different goals. Other nations have different goals. Why do we make adaptation a part of our success arsenal? We adapt. Why? Why do we use one conversation with one child? We use a different kind of conversation with another. Why do you raise your tone with one person and the other and you're very gentle and you stroke? When I had a family, I asked my mother, I said, Mama, please teach me about children. What do you know about children? She had nine, seven lived. And the first thing she said was, they're all different. And she interpreted the scripture, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. She believed that there was an invisible, definite, divine, and traceable path Path, that was the first word God gave me for the word assignment. Path, she believed that every child, every human born had an invisible path in them. And if you trained up a child in the divine path he had an inclination for, he would not depart from it when he got older. If he had an inclination toward electronics, that was the path that was divinely imprinted in his nature. The smartest dog in the world has a difficult time mooing. <laughs> the cow nature doesn't exist. My mother believed that if you could find the innate, inside imprint on a child, what the child loved, what it was cut out to be, created to be, that if you would work with that path, that child would become so stabilized that no wind could shake it off of its divine course. 
So if one wanted to play the guitar, mama bought him a guitar. Now she didn't feel that way about hunting. My dad always enjoyed murdering little ducks, always has. Just him and Brother Holton. It's a killer nature. Gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful green feathers, mallard green necks falling from the sky, dead. And that excited Brother Holton and Brother Murdoch. That was not my inclination. I feed ducks, they kill them. Just, just a difference in us. By the way, I heard about your rich, rich ministry too, Brother Holton. So many people so blessed by what God's put inside you. Mother believed that you talked to one child one way and you talked to another child a different way. I want to massage into your understanding the great value of adapting. If you're in the presence of a talker, listen. If you're in the presence of a quiet listener, speak and initiate in birth. Find the missing ingredient in the immediate environment and become that ingredient, adapting to what's there. Adapting to the current. Very few ministries really understand transition in a service. When God moves another way, go with it. When God goes this way, flow with it. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive. I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. 
when I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. Adapting to the current. Very few ministries really understand transition in a service. When God moves another way, go with it. When God goes this way, flow with it. What's he doing? Where is he? What does he desire? What does he want? Like the song I choose to believe. You said, Mike, I've never heard that song. Me neither, but I really like it. <laughs> Aren't you glad God takes you to his creative kitchen and says, what kind of cake would you like to make? Sometimes we consider adaptation to be a denial, a rejection of our uniqueness. I've spoken many times at a great church, you would all know, and famous people, head of it, up north. Everybody knows these people. They're on TV all the time. But they give me 22 minutes in the pulpit on Sunday morning. And one Sunday morning when I'd finished, I turned around to the famous pastor and says, Could I, I looked at the people and I says, because he had told me before I go to church, he says, we're through it this time. Okay. And so I asked the people as, when I, you know, I, I was in the flow. I said, can I have five more minutes? Of course, everybody lifts their hands. So I'll go five, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes. You have 30 minutes. I said, can I have five more minutes? And then I turned to, of course, there, there's a roar from the people. Yeah. Because, you know, just, I just went there once a year. So it was sort of a, you know, it was a different for them. So they was, they was willing to stay in there. He's over on the side and here's him. I turned to him. I said, can I have five more minutes? I want to slap his head off. Just had a moment of humanity hit me right in the middle of the anointing. Just choo, pow. You little rascal. I have flown this far. I have done it. And you, how dare you? But I adapted. Why? Because I remembered when I didn't. I remember being in a great church. On the West Coast, thousands. And the pastor said, Mike, we've got to, uh, I've got to switch crowds. And there's only 15 minutes between. And thousands have to leave the parking lot in 15 minutes to get the other crowd in. It's real tight. And man, it's hard on our church if you don't dismiss exactly at this time. Well, I got carried away. I use that scripture, quench not the spirit. Didn't use that scripture, honor the elder. <laughs> Got this scripture. Don't you like having such a choice that you can sort of confirm any decision you make with whatever you. Pastor, I, I didn't adapt. Did he kick me? No. Uh -uh. Slap me? No. Keep my salary? No. Just never invited me back. I think adaptation is the hidden secret to perpetual favor. Where am I needed? For what am I needed? You don't need me in this position? Is there a position I can have? Where can I go? You need it now? I'll get it. Adaptation. It's the mystery. It's the golden thread to unending acceptance. I don't doubt for one moment 
there are moments you don't have an option. I'm not here to contradict the divine moments like when the prophet was instructed by the king, change your prophecy of Israel, curse them instead of bless them. And he said, I can't. I can't go back. That's what God said. There are times in your life when adaptation would be defiance to a divine law. There are times that adaptation is literally a denial of an instruction from God. There are times and moments in your life where adaptation is the sign of weakness instead of strength. I'm not talking about those moments where adaptation. I'm not talking about that. I, I continuously live a life of adaptation. We'll pick you up at 9 o'clock. An hour later, I'm sitting in the hotel room, sweaty, exhausted, still waiting for them to show up. But if you understand that adaptation can have a divine purpose and a divine benefit and a perpetual reward, if you can understand, like C.M. Ward, I just was, have been doing 10 hours a day of, of TV taping, which, by the way, on a few days in a row, 10 hours a day is an awful, awful lot of teaching. My mouth was so sore last night. I said, oh, God, give me another mouth over here. You know, it was so sore. But one of the illustrations I gave yesterday was C.M. Ward was standing, the famous revival time speaker for the radio broadcast of the Assemblies of God in Springfield, Missouri. He was standing, and he relates a story. It's either him or a preacher friend of mine, but it was his story. So he was standing at the airline ticket counter. The ticket lady denied him entrance and rejected, rejected him. He says, I've had the reservation for three weeks. I'm sorry, sir, the plane's full. He was angry. He was upset. And he watched the plane take off. And while the plane was in the air, it exploded. Over 200 people were killed. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I know mine by name. The Antichrist system is a number system. The Jesus Christ system is a name system. The distinguishing feature of a name over a number is that a name has an origin and a destiny. We're part of the linkage. Hallelujah. He's the Alpha and the Omega. I'm a part of the perpetual family of God. Our unwillingness to adapt could sabotage us, destroy us. I have other, two other wonderful, treasured friends of mine who were denied access on a flight and became so angry they insisted on speaking to the authorities at the airport. And through their passion and anger, the authorities wavered, weakened, and allowed them to go ahead and get on the plane without the necessary official papers. And their plane crashed in two hours, and they died. I spoke at their memorial service. It was the pastor who was with them at the airport that came to me and whispered, nobody knows this. But they were denied access on the flight. But they became so angry, they fought their way through it. They were given seats and crashed and died. What we often think is a demonic obstacle is a divine shield of protection. So when the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life and you want to cultivate habitual, habitual, habitual sensitivity 
to the voice of the Spirit. Let me go quickly, just give you a review. Won't have time to give the message, but it's, it's just too essence oriented. I received a letter from a presbyter in Dexter, Missouri. It was abrupt, brash, four, five, six sentences. Stationary wasn't fancy, almost didn't accept it, rough. Turned out to be one of the best friends God ever gave me. His wife had a beautiful dress shop, gave thousands of clothes. It was incredible what God worked out of that relationship because I adapted to his expectation. Fullerton, California, I received a letter. You cannot wear any colored shirts in the pulpit. Every shirt you wear must be white, and the ties must have no design. They must be very non-flashy ties. I'm infuriated. I'm a young preacher. At the time I was a young preacher, I wore real... It's different clothes. Let me just put that way. Just for, you know, I was, it was a, you want to be noticed, you want to be obvious, and I was. How dare you tell me wear white shirt? I wear it. Pick a black shirt. I won't. But something in me said adapt. What do you mean adapt? This is me. Praise God. You don't like me. You don't like me. You don't give me. And it turned out to be one of the best places in the world to preach. They accepted and embraced my ministry. And all it cost me was a white shirt. Small hinges swing big doors. Little keys open bank vaults. A little adaptation can double, double the favor in your life. Double. The secret of Billy Graham is not anointing, never has been. I've met men with three times more power in the area of healing. I've met others in many areas. He's organized, no doubt about it. Two years in advance, sends a couple in, they arrange the city, networks. But the secret to Billy Graham is his adaptation. He has been able to distinguish between doctrine that matters and doctrine that doesn't. He's been able to work with Catholics, Baptists, Methodists. What's opened so many doors? Adaptation. He doesn't enter unnecessary conflict. He avoids confrontation that creates distraction. And on the Larry King show, every time you see him, miraculous because I study one night Larry King asked him what about this argument on abortion and here's what Billy Graham said that's a good question Larry I would need to think more about that and and be reminded that that's why Jesus came to the earth to die on the cross for our sins that the blood of Christ could forgive us our sins and that the peace that people are looking for how did he get from the belly of a woman to Golgotha I have no idea but he absolutely in a single sentence transitioned the genius interviewer of this generation he transitioned his focus in a single sentence from the belly of a woman to Golgotha and I'm sitting there he he, he he asked you about abortion. That was your opportunity to tackle him. He adapted. It's a secret. It's a secret to a great woman. It's the secret of Rebecca. It's the mystery behind perpetual favor. Look at three, write this down, Genesis 24. You 
You can read it later. Genesis 26. And let's invest some focus on how to adapt to a new environment, a different position, a new job, because adaptation is the miracle, the miracle of influence. Abraham was old, well stricken in age. The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. I'll swear thee, I'll make thee swear by the, by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanite, Canaanites among whom I dwell. Verse 4, are you marking it? But thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, take a wife unto my son Isaac. The servant said unto him, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me. If you are a woman, circle the section of that scripture. If you're a man, you circle it so you can use it in your private devotions with your wife. Per adventure. <laughs> this woman. What if, what if the woman, he's been around Sarah. He's heard the giggling of Sarah behind the door when Abraham was discussing the potential for childbirth with angelics, beings. He's heard Sarah. Eleazar, this servant, is the same man who saw Abraham produce Ishmael before Isaac came up. How many wish your mistakes would not last as long as your miracles? Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from which thou camest? Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee. And thou shalt take a wife. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I know you've had a bad experience with... I know you... you I know you hadn't been around the most spiritual women in the world, and I want to remind you that Sarah did not have the advantage of books and tapes. I know that what you've seen in my house is not really life-changing, but an angel is going to go before you, and you will meet this woman. And the servant believed him. It's okay. If the woman, watch this, if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then that shall be clear from this mouth. I want to bring not my son thither again. In other words, don't give him another chance. This is his chance, this is it. Servant put his hand on the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. The servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hands, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. He made his camels. Then now how long? Long trip. He made his camels to kneel down without the city by the well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, now notice he went where the women were. Mine has slowed down incredibly this weekend. 
Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, notice he initiates, let down thy picture, I pray thee that, that I may drink, that she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And that's the way I'll know you've showed kindness to my master. Adaptation is the key to access. Adaptation is the key into the presence of uncommon achievers. Adaptation gives life to anything that's dying. And here's the essence. He asked the woman for a drink and she changes her whole schedule. She changes her plans. She sees this old man and she says, not only will I give you water, but I will take care of the camels for you. We're not talking about three sips of H2O. We're, ta we're, ta we're talking about a, somebody, I had never figured it, but somebody gave me in the hours. Have you studied that, how long it took for a camel? Was it two hours? But it took hours to fill up camels. They had to drink it hours. I'm not, I'm not talking about, oh, here's your drink. Here, I'll fill it up again. Here's your camel. We're talking about her whole day changed. Her life changed. She stopped her focus, changed it, made him the focus. Not only will I take care of you, you stay seated. You relax. You be there. You're an old man. I'll take care of those camels. Pastor Dean's got a young wife. I laugh, say, somebody to push your wheelchair fast. <laughs> say adaptation. <laughs> say it again. Oh, come on, say it with passion. <laughs> say it again. <laughs> say it again. <laughs> Do you realize that your future will require adaptation? One, when you and Karen made your decision to get married, that excited me. Still see the smile and y'all flew down to Florida. We missed you those days. Karen's a little different than when y'all were dating, isn't she? He said, a lot. Karen, would you stand? She's interpreting in Spanish. This is Karen. Good looking woman. Karen, the one that you wake up to every day <laughs> is a little different than the one you knew. Is that correct? You said very much, a lot, very much two worlds what perpetuates any relationship how long y'all been married he, he don't know see he looked at you wow. and he is handling the figures of my finances I say how long you been married he goes blank 21 years in two weeks What's the secret? Adaptation. When the difference doesn't matter as much as the benefit. Hallelujah. 
adaptation is sometimes thrust on us. Several people told me to tell you how much they loved you. I don't remember their names, but they gave me all kind of names and how much your husband had meant to them. When you were thrust into widowhood and the man of your life who protected you, talked to you, your confidant, he was everything to you. Pow! He's gone. For you to move into another world, your whole world changed. Your whole life changed. Friendships even changed. Sometimes adaptation is thrust on you without a choice. Sometimes you don't get to choose. Sometimes there's an instant loss. Sometimes everything, you're, you're there. You're suddenly, you're there. Sometimes you won't survive unless you do adapt. And sometimes there's not even a season of transition to learn anything. Sometimes adaptation is required instantly. And that's where the only person who can help you transition is the Holy Spirit. The only person. The only person. It is not in you physically, emotionally, mentally. You cannot transition like that without a supernatural touch from God. His habitual companionship. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3. Every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, He gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. So when the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life and you want to cultivate habitual, habitual, habitual sensitivity to the voice of the Spirit. Amen. 
Let me go quickly, just give you a review. Won't have time to give the message, but it's, it's just too essence oriented. I received a letter from a presbyter in Dexter, Missouri. It was abrupt, brash, four, five, six sentences. Stationary wasn't fancy. Almost didn't accept it. Rough. Turned out to be one of the best friends God ever gave me. His wife had a beautiful dress shop, gave thousands of clothes. It was incredible what God worked out of that relationship because I adapted to his expectation. Fullerton, California, I received a letter. You cannot wear any colored shirts in the pulpit. Every shirt you wear must be white, and the ties must have no design. They must be very non-flashy ties. I'm infuriated. I'm a young preacher. At the time I was a young preacher, I wore real, it's different clothes. Let me just put that way. Just for, you know, I was, it was a, you want to be noticed, you want to be obvious, and I was. How dare you tell me wear white shirt? I wear it, pick a black shirt I want. But something in me said adapt. What do you mean adapt? This is me. Praise God, you don't like me, you don't like me, you don't give me. And it turned out to be one of the best places in the world to preach. They accepted and embraced my ministry. And all it cost me was a white shirt. Small hinges swing big doors. Little keys open bank vaults. A little adaptation can double, double the favor in your life. Double. The secret of Billy Graham is not anointing, never has been. I've met men with three times more power in the area of healing. I've met others in many areas. He's organized, no doubt about it. Two years in advance, sends a couple in, they arrange the city, networks. But the secret to Billy Graham is his adaptation. He has been able to distinguish between doctrine that matters and doctrine that doesn't. He's been able to work with Catholics, Baptists, Methodists. What's opened so many doors? Adaptation. He doesn't enter unnecessary conflict. He avoids confrontation that creates distraction. And on the Larry King show, every time you see him, it's been miraculous because I study. One night, Larry King asked him, what about this argument on abortion? And here's what Billy Graham said. That's a good question, Larry. I would need to think more about that and, and be reminded that that's why Jesus came to the earth, to die on the cross for our sins, that the blood of Christ could forgive us our sins, and that the peace that people are looking for. How did he get from the belly of a woman to Golgotha? I have no idea, but he absolutely, in a single sentence, transitioned. The genius interviewer of this generation, he transitioned his focus in a single sentence from the belly of a woman to Golgotha. And I'm sitting there. He... he, he he asked you about abortion. That was your opportunity to tackle him. He adapted. It's a secret. It's a secret to a great woman. It's the secret of Rebecca. It's the mystery behind perpetual favor. Look at three, write this down, Genesis 24. You can read it later. Genesis 26. 
And let's invest some focus on how to adapt to a new environment, a different position, a new job, because adaptation is the miracle, the miracle of influence. Abraham was old, well stricken in age. The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. I'll swear thee, I'll make thee swear by the, by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanite, Canaanites among whom I dwell. Verse 4, are you marking it? But thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, take a wife unto my son Isaac. The servant said unto him, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me. If you are a woman, circle the section of that scripture. If you're a man, you circle it so you can use it in your private devotions with your wife. Peradventure, <laughs> this woman. What if, what if the woman been around Sarah. He's heard the giggling of Sarah behind the door when Abraham was discussing the potential for childbirth with angelic beings. He's heard Sarah. Eleazar, this servant, is the same man who saw Abraham produce Ishmael before Isaac came up. How many wish your mistakes would not last as long as your miracles? Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from which thou camest? Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I know you've had a bad experience with... I know you... you I know you hadn't been around the most spiritual women in the world, and I want to remind you that Sarah did not have the advantage of books and tapes. I know that what you've seen in my house is not really life-changing, but an angel is going to go before you, and you will meet this woman. And the servant believed him. It's okay. If the woman, watch this, if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then that shall be clear from this mouth. Only bring not my son thither again. In other words, don't give him another chance. This is his chance, this is it. Servant put his hand on the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. The servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hands, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. He made his camels. Then now how long? Long trip. He made his camels to kneel down without the city by the well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, now notice he went where the women were. Mine has slowed down incredibly this week, hasn't it? <laughs> Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. 
Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, notice he initiates, let down thy picture, I pray thee that, that I may drink, that she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And that's the way I'll know you've showed kindness to my master. Adaptation is the key to access. Adaptation is the key into the presence of uncommon achievers. Adaptation gives life to anything that's dying. And here's the essence. He asked the woman for a drink and she changes her whole schedule. She changes her plans. She sees this old man and she says, not only will I give you water, but I will take care of the camels for you. We're not talking about three sips of H2O. We're, ta we're, ta we're talking about a, somebody, I had never figured it, but somebody gave me in the hours. Have you studied that, how long it took for a camel? Was it two hours? But it took hours to fill up camels. They had to drink it hours. I'm not, I'm not talking about, oh, here's your drink. Here, I'll fill it up again. Here's your camel. We're talking about her whole day changed. Her life changed. She stopped her focus, changed it, made him the focus. Not only will I take care of you, you stay seated. You relax. You be there. You're an old man. I'll take care of those camels. Pastor Dean's got a young wife. I laugh, say, somebody to push your wheelchair fast. <laughs> say adaptation. adaptation. Say it again. Oh, come on, say it with passion. Adaptation. Say it again. Adaptation. Say it again. Adaptation. Do you realize that your future will require adaptation? One, when you and Karen made your decision to get married, that excited me. Still see the smile, and y'all flew down to Florida. We missed you those days. Karen's a little different than when y'all were dating, isn't she? He said, a lot. Karen, would you stand? She's interpreting in Spanish. This is Karen. Good-looking woman. Karen, the one that you wake up to every day <laughs> is a little different than the one you knew. Is that correct? You said very much, a lot, very much two worlds. What perpetuates any relationship? How long y'all been married? He, he don't know, see, he looked at you. Wow. And he is handling the figures of my finances. I say, how long you been married? He goes blank. 21 years in two weeks. What's the secret? Adaptation. When the difference doesn't matter as much as the benefit. Hallelujah. 
adaptation is sometimes thrust on us. Several people told me to tell you how much they loved you. I don't remember their names, but they gave me all kind of names and how much your husband had meant to them. When you were thrust into widowhood and the man of your life who protected you, talked to you, your confidant, he was everything to you. Pow, he's gone. For you to move into another world, your whole world changed whole life changed. Friendships even changed. Sometimes adaptation is thrust on you without a choice. Sometimes you don't get to choose. Sometimes there's an instant loss. Sometimes everything comes. You're, you're there. You're suddenly, you're there. Sometimes you won't survive unless you do adapt. And sometimes there's not even a season of transition to learn anything. Sometimes adaptation is required instantly, and that's where the only person who can help you transition is the Holy Spirit. The only person. The only person. It is not in you physically, emotionally, mentally. You cannot transition like that without a supernatural touch from God. His habitual companionship accessing his life, accessing his mind. When Jesus left, imagine the 12 disciples walking with him, going out there, watching him teach. Can you see them passing out the bread, the loaves and the fishes, and somebody tugging at Peter and saying, how, how, how did you get to work for him? How can I, how can I get, I can't believe he all these miracles. And Peter says, he has to choose you. Can you see? Can you see, Peter? He came to our boat. Can you see him? The cockiness of Peter. The confidence. Incredible tingling as he walked beside Jesus. Cut off the ear. What you need. And suddenly he watches the bleeding broken body of his master as men treated him like a piece of dirt. And Jesus did nothing. Did nothing. Did nothing. What happened between that picture when the little woman said, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter said, not me, not me, not me. She came back, don't, I think you, I think I saw you in the crowd giving out bread. Not me. And she came, she said, you are. And so he wanted to prove that he wasn't a disciple. So he said, I'll cuss for you and show you I'm not. But he ends up writing part of the Bible because there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting and cloven tongues as a fire set upon each one of them and they all begin to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit of God gave utterance. And they said, these men have been with Jesus. He said, the Holy Spirit will accompany you, talk to you, guide you. Who is the greatest force that can help you adapt to emerging needs, a different environment, a different world? The one who created you. He created where you've been. He created where you're entering. He qualified you for there. He qualifies you for here. And the same Ruth that was raised in Moab. I just did a whole month of studies on the uncommon woman, the unforgettable woman. The same Ruth raised in heathenism says, Your God 
will be my God. Your people will be my people. Are you with me? Adaptation is the seed that guarantees the harvest you dreamed about. Adaptation is not your loss of honor. It's your seed of honor in another. When Ruth said, I will adapt to your environment, you're leaving Moab. You're going to Bethlehem. I will adapt to where you're going. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I will adapt to what you want me to. That was a seed of honor. Adaptation is woman's greatest gift. It's her dominant skill. It's a mind thing. Men can't handle the pain a woman can handle. Man has a headache, he lays down. <laughs> you got four rambunctious boys. I've already taught Michael today. Michael spends a few minutes. Oh, Natalie, Natalie. I can say, Natalie, Natalie, Natalie. I can say, Natalie. He feels called to fly back to France for three weeks. <laughs> gotta go, gotta go, you know, God's calling. <laughs> Upset with my mother, I'd say, Mama, why do you make me always the one that has to change? because you're the one that can. And Sister Stalls assists me here quietly behind. You know why my mother and daddy stayed married 63 years? Do you think it's because he licked her face every day? I didn't mean to unleash your imagination so swiftly. I, some of you. <laughs> Do you? Th <sighs> Mama would tell Daddy, Daddy, call me something sweet. Because she had heard other men call their wife, sweetheart, honey. She said, Daddy, call me something sweet. He said, okay, Jam. <laughs> now, Daddy will tell you that the secret to 63 years was not even in his prayer room. My mother craved conversation. She loves sound. In fact, one of my sisters had a very idiotic husband. Hopefully he's still in prison where I put him. But mother liked him. You know why mama liked him? He talked. He lied, cussed. There's other words I can't use because we're global. Mother was a master at adaptation. If eight people showed up at the house, she was in the kitchen, what would y'all like to eat? If I got home at two o'clock in the morning, she'd say, baby, what would you want to eat? I said, oh, mom, it's too late. Oh, no, you got to eat something. I had a lot of earaches growing up and a lot of toothaches. That's the way I remember my childhood, earaches and toothaches. Oh, oh, many, many. And Mama would heat olive oil in a teaspoon on a fire, and you put your head on crying, crying, and pour that hot olive oil into your ear. 
they said it dissolved, so I have no idea what it did, but it's put, I, it may have just changed the direction of the pain or something, but anyway, it, it worked. It's, it's like the guy goes, the doctor says, my head hurt, the doctor hit him in the stomach and says, the pain's changed. <laughs> Adaptation. Adaptation's a seed. It was the secret of Rebecca. She changed everything and she became the wife of Isaac. Isaac dug a well. The Philistines fought him over it and he dug another one. They fought him over it and he dug another one. Redigging the wells of his father Abraham. I'm saying this. Dig another well. Adapt. Move away from it. Let go of what's tormenting you. Let go of the distraction. Don't fight for something in the past when God's given you something in the future. Don't sit there and make a fight over baloney when God's got a steak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what's in French. You've been there. Tell him he needs to hear that. Write him a note. <laughs> Say, dig another well. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Would you stand? I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet telling others about it and I hope you're getting by the way I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your mp3 every single day two minutes of wisdom be a blessing sometimes I go a little over because I get excited I want you to be a part of this ministry I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.